especially from the outsider's perspective, as someone who was not even on the show at this time, what were your first impressions watching it and how did you feel? Okay, so I actually made notes here. And the first note uh, that I wrote down is, eating humans. Oh, great. This is my episode. (laughs) (laughs) My name is Anna Silk. For six seasons, I played Bo on the hit TV series, Lost Girl. I am so happy you are here for the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast to take a trip down memory lane with me, the amazing cast, and some very special guests. I'm so glad to finally be able to say the family is back together again. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast. Yes. A very unconventional episode of the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast, because look who is sitting beside me. For those who are watching, you can see it is a lovely Miss Rachel Scarston, um, who, as you may know, was not in season one of Lost Girl. So we have a very interesting perspective today. (laughs) Um, But in typical Lost Girl Rewatch fashion, I'm going to read a little intro that I wrote. For Miss Scarston. I did want to say first, this is this was a rewatch for me because I had seen this episode, but it was interesting to watch it now. Totally. A- again and, and be like, wow, I don't even remember these things. So it's funny because I've heard people talk like that. Mm-hmm. So from, from that sense, I am rewatching it. But yes, no, I, I was not there. You were not there. No. Um, okay. okay go. So here we are. Intro. For Miss Scarston. Okay. You guys ready for this? <laughs> it's going to make me laugh and maybe cry. Okay. And make Rachel laugh too. Let's go. In his famous song, The Gambler, the great Kenny Rogers once sang, <laughs> you got to know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away, and know when to run. I believe... He was singing about my co-host today, who can get to the heart of any given situation faster than anyone I have ever seen. If you want a shining example. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. If you want a shining example of what it means to show up fully in the world and to show up fully in your own life then look no further than the woman sitting next to me today. I don't know that she knows how much I have considered who she is in my own life. I have often asked in many situations, what would Rachel do? Because she has a way of quickly cutting through to what matters the most and doesn't give her time or focus to the things that don't. To be in her presence is honestly a spiritual experience as she holds space for people around her like no one else I've ever seen. Like her character on the show, this woman truly has wings. And if you pay close enough attention, she is a guiding light for all of us. Please welcome the radiant (laughs) Rachel Scorston. Yay! I was expecting more laughs and less tears. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't help it. it. Oh that my god! So <laughs> I'm just hitting the mic. Oh. You guys, I think this is an example of. You guys have ov- often commented at cons how close we all seem. We are. We yeah. are. We legitimately have this fondness for each other. The whole cast does. Um, but doing this podcast with you has been so special. I love you. I love you too. I didn't expect that. I didn't. I thought you were going to just be like, <laughs> "Here's right. Here she is." Uh, no, you deserve a, a big intro. Um, as you I, are, I a feel big... like I want to keep this and read it later, <laughs> <laughs> or or at least when just I'm having a down to Kenny day. Rogers <laughs> sing the gambler. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting Kenny Rogers, but <laughs> I know you're probably like, I don't even know who that is. Oh, um, I do. Kenny Rogers Roasters. Wasn't that a restaurant? I don't. It probably was. But he was like, that's the, that's the way I know Kenny okay, Rogers. He's like country I knew music. he was a singer as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's no longer with us, I don't think, Mr. Kenny Rogers. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Kenny Rogers no. as much as we love him. We're here to talk about episode six, 
of season one yes. called Food for Thought. It was written by Pamela Pinch and directed by John Fawcett. So my question for you, Rachel, is especially from the outsider's perspective, as someone who was not even on the show at this time, what were your first impressions watching it and how did you feel? Okay. So I actually made notes here. Excellent. And the first note uh, that I wrote down is eating humans. Oh, great. This is my episode. <laughs> But it was it was kind of beautifully and viscerally shot in a sense, and I I think I was we've talked about this before in the podcast, but I was so taken aback with how beautiful it was. Mm -hmm. It was really the production quality of that show was so good, and and when you know she's cutting the meat, I know, like you're just like ooh, and you expect her to be the villain, but then she's not. She's actually a fae, and and so. But I just thought that there were so many points in this episode where things were beautifully shot. And I, yeah, I was really, really impressed um, by the episode. So that was my my first impression. And then very shortly thereafter, my next impression was, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much chemistry you and Zoe had. <laughs> <laughs> like when, by the time at the end when Chris is, um, you know, you're having that little thing... Uh, in the bar and you're like, oh, is it okay if I see other people? And yeah, he's yeah. like, yeah, that's fine with me. And I was like, who cares about you, Chris? Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. It's time for Zoe. <laughs> that was a big episode for, for Zoe and I, because yeah. first of all, you know, we do a lot of things together in it, but just on a personal level, you know, that was a point in the season where Zoe and I were getting to know each other, but on this episode in particular, we spent a lot of time together. Yeah. So we have um, like all the stuff that's shot in the like lab um, we spent a ton of time just like sitting, waiting between takes. And where we, was that lab? I, you know what? I actually said to my husband last night, I'm like, I remember everything about Lost Girl. Like when I watched it, I remember all the locations. I can't remember where that place okay, is. Yeah. It's, it's like, like wow. we walked on a spaceship somewhere <laughs> yeah. and, and but all the overhead lights and stuff. I was like, this well, is a cool location. The overhead lighting, that was all David Green. I mean, that, that lighting yeah. up of that room was pretty magnificent. Yeah. It was um, beautifully, beautifully it, lit. It, it was. But so I don't know where it was. It was probably just a dungeon somewhere. And David <laughs> made it look nice. <laughs> he, he made everything look nice. But it was a complicated location too because um, the the floors were like tinny with little holes in them. And I had the, the most uncomfortable shoes I've ever worn in my life on for the whole episode. Really high heels. I had the most sore feet I've ever had in my life and they were swollen for like three days. I had to like ice my feet, whatever. But I, that's one thing I remember. So Zoe and I, because our feet hurt so much, we would crouch down between takes. It was Zoe wearing heels? Well, I think her feet, her, I mean, you know, Zoe and her feet. I'm just kidding. There's nothing about <laughs> Zoe and her feet. I'm start a rumor. She was probably just in solidarity, <laughs> crouching down with me. Yeah. But... um. Zoe and I got to know each other. Like that was where we like shared stories of growing up and like shared personal stories and like got to know each other really, really well. It was in episode six. Yeah. Well, it shows. Yeah. It, especially that scene in the bar when you're drinking and you're kind of oh, testing yeah. out your powers and if you can control them. Oh my goodness. It was, it was like bouncing off the screen. And that's the kind of thing that you can't... For sure, if, if you're friends with someone or... But I mean, I've seen people who are lovers in real life and they have no chemistry on screen. You cannot create that. It, it's just... No. You can do your best to, to foster it and there kind of... There can be some good writing it. and there can be some good Absolutely, moments. But, but you either have that spark or you don't. Yeah. And you guys had that spark in well, spades. Zoe has that... She's so charming, right? And she's so... Um, I don't know. She has this sure of her selfness that when she kind of looks at you and gives you a little smile, you, you react, you know, and that scene, you, you do see it. I love that scene. That scene took a while to shoot because there's a lot of little pieces to it. And Zoe and I, I know we've told this story at cons, but um, for people who haven't heard it, there was moments like where there was a lot of background in the bar for that. And, you know, half of the background would be lit and on camera at one given time. And then we'd turn around the other half would be on camera. But there was one point where, you know, I'm supposed to look around and be like, the sexual energy in this place is off the charts or whatever. Right, yeah. And we looked over and every single background person had their, they were going, 
<laughs> like just for, for people not watching, I have my head down. I'm like looking at my phone, like texting so like a, a bar in today's time. <laughs> exactly. With like no sexual tension. People are like <laughs> connecting on their phones, but it was hilarious. And Zoe and I, of course, couldn't stop laughing when that happened. And we were like, please do something, just anything. And the, the background were wonderful. They were like, oh, of course, of course. But, um, but yeah, it was so funny. And then we couldn't stop laughing. And so it took us a while to get that scene because of the laughter, which yeah. Zoe can pull together and I cannot ever. Um, yeah, that is a Zoe superpower. Okay. But actually this leads me to a question I had for you because okay. in watching that scene, yeah. was that supposed to be the doll or was that supposed to be another bar? No, it was supposed to be the doll. Okay. I wonder why you're asking that. That's interesting. Because it, it wasn't clear the, the way it was spoken about. And actually this, it, it was almost as though you were out at like a bar testing your powers, but the doll was a fey bar. Wouldn't you be out testing it at a human bar, like just a regular place? I don't know. That's a good question. And it seemed like it was shot to try and hide the fact that it was, it was the, doll. the doll. Because normally we, when we would shoot at the doll, you'd see Rick at the bar and, and there were kind of these shots. I mean, the we would have shot in a them. different bar. We would have. I mean, that's a good question. You yeah. know what I just realized? Or would we? Everyone's watching. We're... I'm wearing a, a robe. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> actually. Oh. <laughs> because because yeah. when we were getting the scene when I'm getting ready we're get, to we're go getting to the there. bar. We're getting there. With Kenzie, this is the robe. that This is Bo's robe. And the reason I'm wearing it is because it's mine. I wear this robe. I have worn this robe almost and every just day. just wears robes all the time. <laughs> She's like the female human. I'm a Hefner. guru. I come out in my robe. Um this is my like robe. And this was the robe that Bo wears when she's getting ready. For but it wasn't your robe before. They gave it to you no, for the show and then you took right. it. Yeah. I, was, right. I must wear my own robe. <laughs> I only wear, wear my robe. Yeah. It's in my, every contract <laughs> that I have. It's like, if there's a robe in a scene, it must it's be that robe. Yeah. It has to be this one. <laughs> anyway, this is Bo's robe. That's why I'm wearing a robe in this episode. It's, it's, it's not so obvious that it's a robe though, because you're it, but it sitting, it could just be a silk shirt. I guess. Similar to the silk shirt you wore in this episode, actually, which was very flattering on you. That blouse? Mm. That, that it looks so funny to see Bo undercover because then she kind of looks like a regular. <laughs> when you came on the screen in that outfit, um, you know how we ask everyone, "Is there something that didn't work in this episode?" I was going to be like, "Probably your hairdo." Oh my god, my hairdo! <laughs> I mean, in like it does two thousand with butterfly clips, it would have been amazing. It would have been amazing, yeah. but also it gave the undercover feel of like it's oh, yeah. clearly not Bo, right? No, like no, that hair obviously. is not Bo. <laughs> but it, yeah, it was very funny and actually. Um, when I was thinking of like the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges in, in this episode, when I come out in that outfit, we shot in the spaceship still. It's not a spaceship, but whatever that location was that I can't remember. And you see Bo like slow-mo walking down that hallway. And it was this long hallway. And there was, it was like a wind tunnel, that hallway. There was a, a wind coming through the whole time, like a And so as I'm walking, my eyes were weeping, like cheers pouring down my face because you can't, walk. You couldn't see that on camera. No, I know because Linda, the makeup artist who we have met at this point on the podcast, um, was there on the side dabbing tears. And then they'd, they'd be like action. And I'd be like, walk down the hall, um, until we got one without tears. Do you find that sometimes when you're filming though, I'll be doing, I, I'm like, do I not blink as much because my eyes will start to burn in a scene? Yeah. My eyes water a lot in a yeah. scene. But they don't in life. No, no. What's happening? Well, I think maybe you're so intently trying to focus on... I, I don't know. I have, I'd have to go back and watch a scene that I remember my eyes watering in. Well, I was weeping through, through that hallway walk, but it's very brief. And we got a take without, without tears. Without tears. Without tears. Well, that's good. Um, I noticed the very beginning of this episode that Bo says, and I think she says it, maybe someone out there knows, but I think she says it at least three times this season where she says... Blah, 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 blah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> like, it was one of those. And I'm like, it's so funny that we, we did that in that season. Like she really kind of on the nosed those moments, I yeah. think. Because, but it's interesting because it shows kind of Bo's innocence in that world still. But I just noticed that. And then I loved the woman who, you, who was the guest star, who was the ass wang, which, how do we say that? I don't know. I without think laughing, you have to not say ass wang. You have to say as wang, as wang, as wang. Yeah, you really, wang. You really emphasize the ass when right. you say it. Emphasize the wang. <laughs> That's better. As wang. 
No. Aswang. But yes, you think Everyone she's- Everyone should try it right now. Oh my God. Aswang. Um, this is pretty fitting for this episode. <laughs> Look what's beside Rachel and I. A severed hand. And you might wonder why. <laughs> why is there a severed hand? Severed hand? We're not that good. It was just here. It was just- yeah. I'm not kidding. This was- My dogs were just playing with this outside. It's a Halloween decoration, obviously, that my son loves. And- um, my dogs found it because I've, I've been looking for this. But for this episode, this actually really works. I know. When um, she was like, I've eaten cancer, the bubonic plague. I was like, this woman's amazing. I know. <laughs> she, and when she's humming, putting the foot I in, know. like she, she was a fantastic she was, guest star. She was a fantastic guest star. And what I loved about her and about the, the se- like season one, when we because it was very much case of the week. So you get to learn about different Faye, but what mm-hmm. actresses like her did is she made like brought the humanity to them, you 100%. know. Um, Even the I, I really love that actor, the uh, one who's trading with Rick. Yes. Oh my gosh, he's his done face. a lot of stuff. Is, I know, but face. he's I know. Is he Canadian. I think he is Canadian. Yeah. So good. Um, he's amazing. He's amazing. Um, yeah. So it's. Let's see here. Um, what else did I make in my little notes here? Yes, I have Aswang written down. Aswang. Um, still. And this is also in the season when Kenzie really disliked Lauren. Oh, I wrote that in my notes yeah, too. I was pretty, like, like, it's I big forgot in this episode. How much yes. they didn't like. Well, I mean, Lauren, I don't think disliked Kenzie, but I forgot how much Kenzie's character disliked Lauren. And and as I was watching it, I, I thought, oh wow. Um it it was full on in yeah. this episode. Yeah. That's the other thing I thought didn't work in this episode. Ksenia in the scene in her, uh, in the uh, hospital, and there's so much blood coming from her eyes. Right. It was a bit distracting. But right. then when she was in the graveyard with Chris, it was better. She cleaned up a bit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, it's been a really rough day for you. I can only go to a graveyard with slight <laughs> blood in my eyes. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, no, this is it, network television here. Yes. <laughs> um, the other thing that I did notice in this episode, and I knew that this was something we had to work out in season one between Bo and Kenzie, because like this is when we were still finding our feet, right? So because Kenzie's character was so like, would walk into rooms and be like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I want. And da, 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 da. Then Bo had to be this voice of reason of like, uh, 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 Kenzie, like we can't do this. We can't do without, that. So, without being mean mom. Well, without being a school mom, yeah. which is like, because that's not Bo. Yeah. Like Bo. So what I, I, and there was a bit of, there was a few episodes I remember struggling with that. Cause it was like, I just felt like I was like the saintly Bo sitting next, like, and that's not the character. And I was like, are we trying to make Kenzie's jokes work here? What's happening? Like it, it all worked, but I think I struggled with kind of going, no, I know what this is. This, I have to focus on the case. And I just became very laser focused on the case and, and let Kenzie be Kenzie instead of trying to like correct her behavior, which was kind of in the writing sometimes uh, early on. That wasn't particularly noticeable when I watched the episode. I, I actually okay. found the the memory of you and uh, Ken, Bo and Kenzie in that episode that I have the most is this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, the robe scene. And she comes in and she's doing her Kenzie thing and it's mm-hmm. so great and adorable. And then you sit down almost over her on the bed and there's this beautiful like lovingness to it, closeness to it, sexuality to it. Like it was, and I thought you nailed Bo. That moment, I thought you nailed it. So it's funny because it was with her. So if there was any clunkiness to figuring that relationship out, no, the, I didn't uh, notice that. Oh, good. I'm glad. I mean, they, like like figuring anything out in the beginning, right? Well, that's finding, saying that the truth, yeah. Yeah, like finding what that relationship is, like in real relationships too, but yeah. certainly in storytelling on screen. like it, <laughs> but Usually you you know yourself, but in, when you're doing a TV show in the first season, you're trying to figure your character out. You're trying to figure out your character's relationship to other characters. They're trying to figure yeah. their characters out. And everyone in the writer's room is doing the same thing, yeah. right? Because different people are writing episodes. You, ha- you have to maintain the voice of the characters, which of course I can't speak to because I've never written an episode of anything in my life. But I would imagine that it's a huge challenge. And it's funny, over the seasons, we would get to know, oh, this person wrote this episode. This is going to be 
Bo's voice a little more like this in this episode. It was mm. always the same character. They were so good at keeping things consistent. For sure. But there'd be a little bit more humor from this direction yeah. or, or a little more, a little like more gravitas more. in Bo or a little more like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, I just, I, in watching this episode, I, I just remembered that time of like trying to figure out what that relationship was going to be. Um, what else do you have? Well, uh, throughout the whole episode when you go to the biking with Chris. Oh, yeah, the biking. yeah, when uh Ksenia and Chris are in the uh cemetery. Yeah. Which was a beautiful scene. I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, that looks so cold. Oh yeah. <laughs> what we, month did you film that? Well we in s- Toronto. For in everyone Toronto, who we listening. started filming the series in January. Um so but we didn't start with episode six, but it was an Six was an earlier episode for sure. So it would have been like dead of winter and like end of Feb, maybe. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they, March. You know, it's funny. I think when you're an actor and you start watching shows and you see these exterior scenes, um, because you've been in, in those situations where you're wearing like a big parka and it's really, it's like a hundred degrees outside mm-hmm. or you're wearing a little tank top and there's no leaves on the trees. And you just think <laughs> like, I, it looks so beautiful and, and oh yeah, for sure. Of course they'll, they'll be perfectly warm in that light leather coat that they have on, you yes. know, but in reality, you know, that it's you guys were probably freezing filming that. Yeah. Except that I think I, I mean, it was mostly Ksenia and Chris. They were outside. I feel and like you filmed that whole bike gang scene. Oh yeah, the bike gang scene. That yeah. was yeah. You right. had a badass like pow, 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 pow. yeah. We had a good little yeah. I little liked it. Throw down. Um, the other thing. Oh, the other thing that I really like. Speaking of guest stars, was the security guard. I loved him. <laughs> <What is that? laughs> I actually wrote that. I was like, honey, that makes two of us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow, you really fill out that suit or whatever I said. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, he's, he's a very funny guy so too. That actor, good. I remember always seeing him around, uh, like auditions in Toronto, like commercial auditions and things. Because yeah. we, we weren't up for the same parts, obviously. But <laughs> or um, were you? <laughs> or were we? <laughs> um, I also loved okay the creepy doctor that I sit on. Oh, I sit, yeah, I mean he was so creepy. But in real life, he was such a lovely oh, man. He was so creepy. Oh, he was on so the show. creepy on the show. And like yeah. I know he looks creepy, like such a lech. But in truth, he was a lovely man who I felt like I was taking advantage of, honestly, more than him. Like, I respect you. I know. <laughs> Let me just canoodle with you a minute. But yeah, I was like kind of squirming watching that. But, but that was one of the beautiful things. And again, watching this episode, I thought, you know, there's such a fine line between having humor in a show and then not taking it seriously. Yeah, right. Totally. This show took itself seriously and and the subject matter seriously. And there was a gravitas in um, the telling of these stories. And yet there were these injections of humor throughout Mm -hmm. that I know existed when I came onto the show, but it was really lovely to see that they were there from the beginning. They were. You know, and and the marriage of those two, I think, was part of the magic of the show. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. it's interesting how like like wh- when you're when you're learning to be an actor and you're watching other people's performances like not everyone is one thing just as people are not one thing characters aren't either so like when you can bring a whole person to to the screen it's sort of like when you're watching like cop dramas and they're like they're standing over at a yeah, crime all scene all those cop dramas i'm watching <laughs> <laughs> like Rachel never stops watching cop drama. Can't stop. I when I call her, what's she doing? I'm like, watching can't cop stop watching cop drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I just actually watch- watching a cop drama right now. <laughs> I'm listening to one actually. <laughs> right now. Can't get enough. Um, no, I am totally lost my train of thought. But I, all I remember is like cops like stand over dead bodies and they're like eating a sandwich. Not the dead body. The cop is eating the sandwich. That was clear. But, like, like it brings a whole picture. So like Lost Girl, like where there's a foot and the soup and all that kind of stuff. And, but there's humor in it too. Uh, 100%. I, I don't know what my point was, but I got all of that another, out. Another somehow. great story from Anna Silk. Another really full, <laughs> full story. Another fleshed out story. Another really, <laughs> really fleshed out story. Um, I love you. The snake tank. Okay, so okay, I have this things, I, have things I have an think. issue. Okay, tell me with this. So these are the two things that I didn't think worked in this episode. Okay. For real. I mean, your hair was a joke. 
not it, your hair wasn't a joke. No. My comment about your the hair, hair was, a joke. was the joke. Either way. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, you killed the snake. Yeah. But it like, why? That snake didn't do anything to anybody. And it, it, it was on life support, but I thought another line could have been, this is the bleeding heart in me, thought another line could have been added like, oh, this snake is is really old and should die. Or I, I don't know, it, but it was just like, Bo seemed kind of cold in that moment. You're like, you can't take it with us. Like, let's just kill it. I didn't like that. Um, Kenzie was dying, Rachel. Right. I, but I, I feel like it was <laughs> sensitive. Yes, but that snake is a fae too. That's true. Right? Like we're not talking, I mean, even just regular animals. I saved a, like a grasshopper the other day. Right. So I, I know I'm extreme, but that animal was a fae. She recognized it as a fae. They had it there on life support. Why? It's not, it's not your fault. You didn't write that. <laughs> Pamela Pinch. <laughs> Why? Why? Why did you do that? Actually, I, write, I wrote that. I was right. like, I must wear robes and any snake in any scene must die. No, I'm kidding. I love, I love snakes. Yeah. So that, and then also this, the special effects of the snake when it came up yes. were a little hokey. A little hokey. Yeah. I know. Um, so how do you answer to both of those things? I, I do, I, do, must I answer to both of those things? You I, and Pamela. I don't know. I don't know why Bo thought the snake had to go. Um, I, I don't know. I'm curious if an anyone answer. listening watched it and thought that too, or maybe that's yeah, just let me. Us know. Let us know in the comments if you thought, wow, that was savage of them with the snake. I know. Um, but I will tell you, there was an anger in me filming that scene because really? this is what happened. Oh, this okay. is yucky. This makes me squeamish. Um, but I had that pokey thing mm. and I was poking the snake, right? Like I was like, ah, ah. and it was plexiglass. And I, I punched a side of the pe plexiglass and it took like a chunk out of my knuckle. You know how much that hurts, right? And it wasn't yeah. like a bleeding chunk. It was just like a deep the other day. chunk. Ugh. And I was like, oh, and then we were still going. And it was like three o'clock in the morning and like all the things, right? And your feet are swollen. And my feet are swollen, swollen but I'm like, sense of humor. <laughs> Maintain sense of humor. So I was like, they're like, go again. I thought, oh, whatever, I don't need a Band-Aid. We can't put a Band-Aid. Whatever, let's go. Action. I do it. I'm doing it. I'm trying to get that. I hit the same spot <laughs> again. Full speed, like full. And I was like, wow, I like yelled because it hurt so bad. And they had to come tend to my, my knuckle. And then we kept going, Ugh. whatever. It was just a memory. But in watching that, I remember how much that hurt. Because that hurts. Yeah. I think that the that thing snake. is too, sometimes when you're doing that and you get hurt in a scene. Yeah. Okay. It's not like the biggest problem in the world, but, but what you don't think is that you still have to look good. You still have to finish the scene. There's still a hundred people around waiting to move on because it's three in the morning and all you want to do is just be like, ah! I know. <laughs> you know what you mean? want to be like, I hurt my finger. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. You yeah. know, but yeah. I've seen people do that with things that are even crazier than that. Like yeah. they, they, their legs falling off and they're like, don't, don't worry. worry. It's don't fine. worry about me. I know as actors, we're just, we're conditioned to like, just the show must go on. The show must go on. Mm -hmm. The show must go on. Oh my gosh. What is happening here? Someone's it's calling you. Oh my gosh. Call. It's a scam call. It is not. Oh my God. It's not. I will turn it off. Um, now's not the time. Um, what else? What else do we have here? Uh, well, what do we normally ask people? What worked, well, what didn't? Best memory. Best memory. I, I kind of touched on that. I mean, getting to know Zoe was the best memory for me yeah. in this episode because we just had, we had the time to sit and talk, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, you know, the conversation was so great that we actually still reference that conversation sometimes. Really? Yeah. When we talk to each other, we'll be like, oh, and we'll like make a joke about something we said during that conversation. That's so it was very, special. it was very special. Oh, question. I know you filmed them all out of order and you mm -hmm. sort of referenced this before. Where would this have been filmed? Do you have any recollection I, of that? I, I feel like it was filmed on the earlier side, like probably within the first six. What was the latest episode that you filmed, like number that you filmed the earliest, do you think? Like, did you film 11 or 12 earlier or was it sort of, I know we started with episode one. I believe the second one we filmed was episode five. Oh my gosh. I know. Then I don't know. From there, I don't know. I know two was early. I think six, the one we're talking about today was early. I know it was weird. I don't know how you did that. Uh, four was kind of early. I well, mean. Four, four is pretty early in the counting of. Yeah, but we filmed out of order. No, I know, but like. You would have filmed four early either way if you were filming 13 episodes. 
Well, we could have filmed four You're last. Like, one came first. <laughs> Let me, let me break it down for you how it works. One is the beginning. Okay. Um, I don't, I, so, okay. You, let me ask you questions. Okay. You got cast on the show in season three. I did. That's true. True This story. is true. We have, true we have video evidence. We've yes. done things together. So what did you do when you got cast? Did you watch season one? Yes. Season I remember I... I seem to join shows actually quite frequently around season three. So I've gotten very used to catching up on all the episodes. And usually there's not a lot of lead time between booking the job and starting to film the job. But specifically with Lost Girl, I felt it was, you know, I had quite a familiarity with it because being in Canada, it was all over the place. Like it ads, was. every all over the subway third ad was I know. Lost Girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really had no idea about the Fae lore and I just felt it was really important when I landed in this world at playing someone who existed in that world yeah. for many, many lives to know what was happening. Um, so I think it was one of the producers gave me like a DVD or something uh, and I, yeah, I sat and I watched... All of the, I, I actually went through episode or season one quite quickly. I think mm-hmm. season two was a bit longer, so that took me <laughs> took me a while. <laughs> I think actually we were already filming when I was still watching the end of season two because I remember being in the trailer, mm-hmm. um, and it, maybe it was Chris who came in and he was like, "Oh, it's still going." I was like, "Still going, bro." <laughs> <laughs> There's twenty two. Yeah, um, but it was. Yeah, I, I guess at that point, my my whole thing was kind of just trying to get through it and trying to understand the show and trying to understand, you know, now we speak the language of Lost Girl, but there yeah. is a language of Lost Girl and, oh. and I had to kind of learn that language. And uh, so watching it this time, I think I just enjoyed it more from the perspective of watching it for entertainment, yeah. you know, and I just, I said this to you earlier, but... It's not that all of you guys look old now, because <laughs> you don't. Well, but, we but look like, older for sure. Oh my goodness! But it's like Rick. I was like Rick. He looks like a baby. Chris looks like a baby. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! I couldn't get over how young you all. I know. Looked. We all and, have like the the dewy cheeks. Yeah. Yeah. But it was what fifteen years ago. Yeah. I mean, twelve. I think twelve. 12 years ago. No, God. 13, 14, somewhere t- between 12 and 15 years ago. Yeah, because I joined the show in season three. That would have been 10 years ago. You had done two seasons plus a year. So it was about 13 years ago. Yeah. My goodness. I yeah. know. And and what Rachel was re- referring to in terms of like, we were everywhere. We were. We got so much uh, support in Canada, which, which was fantastic, which was fantastic. And, yeah. and unlike a lot of Canadian television at that time, um, like we were on every subway poster, mm-hmm. uh, everyone on TV, knew Lost Girl everyone when I booked knew it. it, even if they didn't watch yeah. it, you, you had seen they were something. Like, oh, that show. Yeah. I've heard of that show. Yeah. We just got so much support, and which then was you really come to America and they were like, Lost Boys. I know. They're like, what? We don't, <laughs> we don't get this. Until, well, no, I always said about Lost Girl either. I would say to someone, oh, I'm on this show, Lost Girl, and they would either be like, I love that I show. Know. Like, or they would be like, minds. what? Yeah. <laughs> like there was no in between. There I was know. no like, oh yeah, I've heard of that show. I just don't watch it. I feel like that's true for a lot of genre shows. But not in Canada. In Canada, yeah, everyone had heard about the show. Right, right. Some people watched it, some people didn't. But it was, um, yeah, in that sense, I'm, I'm quite proud to... Be Canadian and that they really supported the show they because supported us so much. This was years and years and years ago. It was before you know some of these things that we discuss or deal with in the show that now thankfully are normal yeah. to talk about. They totally. were still sort of taboo at the time. They were, and I have to say, like we're we're coming to an end here in this this episode uh, of the rewatch podcast. But before we finish, I do feel that I must say, you know, we got so much support from showcase and uh, all the producers and um, the network. And 
we have not really mentioned Jay Firestone uh, on this podcast very much because he we were unable to get him to be one of our guests this season. But I, I do have to say that Jay... Um, and the network really took a risk and they put mm-hmm. their, you know, their money on this show at a time when nobody else was doing that because of the nature, like the content. Um, it was risk. It was risky. You know, it was risky. And it Jay, was badass that he did that. He, it was badass. Jay. Yeah. And he really believed in the show he and loved what it stood Lost for. Girl. He had a very clear creative vision and he put a lot on the line to make it happen and bring the show to you guys and, and to cast all of us in it. I mean, I do feel that um, we need to give him a shout out, a big shout out um, because he, you know, wouldn't have existed without that vision, which, which took a lot of, took a lot of bravery back then. Anyway, Rachel, on that note, on that note, (laughs) thank you guys for listening to episode six. Um, We are so excited to do this. And there's more to come. Yes. And what? What else? That's it. That that is all she wrote. That's all she wrote. (laughs) Everyone, take care of everyone in your family. Yes. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye, Bye, guys. When today's spotlight used to come to set, the whole cast would sit up a little straighter. As we knew that one of the people in charge of deciding the fate of our show was in our presence. This could be seen as intimidating energy, but when that person is today's spotlight, you are greeted with so much love and support, and you feel like everything will be all right in the world (laughs) when you are in the steady, capable hands of the wonderful Stephen Finney. Please welcome Stephen Finney. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. It's really good to see you. You too. It's been way too long. It's been way too yes. long. And I have to yes. tell everyone listening that um, when my son Sam was born, Stephen Finney gave mm. us a little fox, which I s- went through my house trying to find. And I can't find him. I know he's here. <laughs> of course. He has not left. <laughs> and I just want you to know, Stephen, his name is Finney. We've Finney. been saying the name Finney in this house for... <laughs> Almost 10 years. <laughs> um, Hopefully all in a good way. All in a yeah, good way. All in a, all good, in way. a good way. Um, nice. So for our listeners, uh, we're trying to show them different aspects of what it took to make Lost Girl. Um, mm-hmm. So Stephen, can you please explain to us what it is you did on Lost Girl? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have again? <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot, people. I did a lot. Uh, so my first encounter with Lost Girl was probably about a year or more, a little more before we shot the pilot. Wow. So I had a script in my hand that was in development that was passed to me by um, my higher ups and said, this is a project we're developing. Um, at the time, it was called Vanity. Oh, I never um, knew that. You didn't know that? No. Yes. There you go. Yes. Oh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but there you That's go. The, it was yeah, called Vanity. Say it all. This is, this is great. The, yeah. So the original pilot was, uh, it was called Vanity and it was about a bisexual succubus. And I looked at it. I said, what am I going to do with this? Because <laughs> everything was outside of my, you know, outside of my world. So um, I thought, just give it a read. And I thought, I I enjoyed it way more than I thought I would, than I expected to. I thought these characters are terrific. Um, And it's not like anything we've ever seen on TV. So I did my notes and Michelle Lavretta had written the pilot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had a little back and forth. And at the time, uh, we had showcase, uh, we decided we were going to shoot some pilots, which we hadn't really done before. And so there were three pilots. Um, that we shot. And uh, we, when we showed this one around to, you know, marketing to sales and our executives, um, the higher ups, they, everyone said, this one's a no brainer. This, this is, it looks so great. Um, the, the acting is terrific. The, 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 
everything about it is so unique and so unusual and we really have to um, do something with it. And it was really before all of that sort of resurgence of superhero, the superhero genre, right? Um, so it was a little bit ahead of its time. And the fact that she was using, um, you know, her sexuality as a superpower and as her strength um, was really something different for a, a female lead way back in 2016, yeah. 20, 2006. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> Oh I God. don't totally remember either. I, I think, think it was 2012. I think it was 2000. I think we did the pilot in like 2010. 10. Yes. Or 11. Yes. And then yeah, we started it sat on the shelf yeah. for like a year. While it we did. did the other it, oh, I remember. And, I was yeah, like <laughs> waiting. <laughs> I know. So was <laughs> yeah. I. So was I. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, everyone was behind it. I mean, initially when we were trying to, to, um, uh, decide which pilots to do. It was a hard sell to shoot that pilot, to get that pilot shot internally because yeah. of the, the content and everything else. Yeah. Um, but, I was going to ask about that too, because the, yeah. the subject matter, I mean, you just say bisexual succubus and it's I, right away. I think there's probably challenges. Yeah. Well, the first question is what is a succubus yes. um, generally, but um, there were those challenges. And, uh, but the one thing we, you know, we thought made it stand out was a, her, the fact that she was bisexual, but it was sort of besi almost beside the point. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about being bisexual. It was about being this, this um, character. And, you know, there's mm -hmm. violence and whatnot, but I don't think we ever used a gun on Lost Girl. One time. One only time. because I shot it. That's the only reason I know. But it was right. done in a really specific way. It was yeah. when Bo was like playing two characters. This was in later seasons. Oh, that's right. And that's I had right. to shoot yes. a gun, which just really stresses me out. And that's the only reason I yeah. remember. But there was no yeah. other. You're right. There was no other yeah. guns. Yeah. So it wasn't. We didn't feel like the violence was gratuitous in any way. Mm -hmm. um, it was all central to the story. But I've wandered off topic as I tend to do. No, um, that's so. great. I mean, these are the, <laughs> you know, my next, my next question was about the challenges in terms of getting yeah. it greenlit and the content of the show. And I think yeah. that it's funny because when I read the pilot, um, you know, the sexual nature of her and the, and her bisexuality, it never felt like it was front and center of the show. No, it was no, so interesting because yeah. I didn't think about, of course I knew that there'd be sexual content and that I would be filming it, but yeah. I didn't really think about it that much because yeah. the story was just so interesting and her backstory, it was so compelling and all these characters she was meeting were so compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that showed our pilot was awesome. It was, it was a terrific uh, pilot. And, you know, um, I stand behind that as one of the best hours of television I've ever worked on. And there are a few episodes of Love's Girl that are, to, you know, I think of like the finale, uh, 213 is one of my favorites. And uh, it's, it's the Garuda and Trick come face to face. I remember in the end. In so that the, would have uh, been 222. Is that 222? Well, because we had 22 episodes. Yeah. Or but was it 213? I think it was two thirteen because okay. it was the one in the at the drive-in where the big oh, confrontation yes. in the drive-in, not the one where the Garuda goes down, right? But the first, yes, sort of fight in the drive-in. I just think that's a really. I think Steve Cochran wrote it. Yeah, um, it's just a every scene is so important, and there's not a there's not an inch of wasted text in that. Yeah, um, and it's beautifully shot. And it's beautifully oh, shot. It's um, beautifully shot. So. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I mean, what we've been doing so far this season is watching season one, which mm -hmm. has been crazy for everyone to watch, but me in particular, because I've watched every episode now, which I haven't seen in 12 years. Yeah. So I'm now watching it again, not knowing what's going to happen. I mean, I remember roughly <laughs> the episode, but I yeah. don't remember it scene by scene. So yeah. it's really cool to see scenes that I don't remember filming necessarily. I mean, I remember certain things, but and I think that I'm struck by how special the show was. I knew it at the time, mm -hmm. but looking back, you know, and I still go to conventions and I meet Lost Girl fans. Have you ever yeah. met Lost Girl fans? Have you come in, uh, in contact we, with the fandom? <laughs> well, when we did uh, in the first couple of years, I remember doing, it was strange. We did Fan Expo in Toronto mm -hmm. before the show even launched. Oh, and, we and it was Chris, Chris and I 
the, the very first time it was like he and I had a booth and pamphlets. Yeah. And I, it was just the two of us like <laughs> handing out these pamphlets. And I remember people Please. walking by being like, what is, what's the succubus? I'm like, oh, well, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and then the next time we went, it was like yeah. this wave yeah. of, of love for the show. I, yeah. And the first two Comic Cons, like the uh, first couple of Comic Cons I went to. Yeah. There were a few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But looking back has been really special for me um, to yeah. remember exactly what we achieved. Because, uh, and I just remember everyone feeling like we were making something special while we were making it, which was really, mm -hmm. I think, a unique experience. Yeah. Um, what are some of your best memories of working on Lost Girl? Oh, best memories. Yeah. Um, uh, this is, this might sound a little pandering to you, but uh, the casting process, casting you and Chris, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it's funny because we had a schedule that we were going for to shoot the pilot. We actually ended up pushing that schedule because we hadn't found a bow yet. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah. And the, it's funny the way you talk about her now, it just sort of triggered in my mind. Um, the fact that, you know, she was a bisexual, but it's, it wasn't her sexuality that was front and center. It wasn't about sex. And a lot of the casting that came in that we saw that's what all the actors were putting forward first. It was like being sexy and fighty and all that kind of stuff. And there was so much more to her. And we were like, they're not hitting it. It's just not getting it. We don't know what it is. And out of the blue, Lisa Parison, our casting director, sent us um, this note and said, um, I've got this last minute, sort of last minute uh, read from this Canadian in LA. She's not what we've been looking for at all, but there's something there. And we looked at it and just like, yeah, yeah. Oh, she's okay. actually, so she's, <laughs> she's actually found the bow that's within, with, that's behind everything else, right? The vulnerability, the, the girl next door is the, you know, the, the girl that doesn't understand her power yet, all that kind of stuff that was so important in the first season. Um, and we're like, yeah. And then you came in and did those, um, crazy, uh, chemistry reads with Chris. I'm like sweating, Wait. thinking about it. It was <laughs> crazy. You were in that room for so long. I remember. I know. I it remember. was electric that room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you broke the wall. Yes. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So that, and then the chemistry reads with, um, Ksenia for, for mm -hmm. Kenzie, mm -hmm. they were a lot of fun. And then when we brought, when we were looking for a Tamsin and doing the reads for Tamsin. Yeah. And uh, we really, it was foremost in our mind, we needed more diversity in our cast mm -hmm. um, as we did with all our shows. And so we were looking and looking and looking and Rachel came in and she did a read with, <laughs> she did a read with Chris. And it was the first time I'd seen Chris in that kind of situation where he didn't know what to do. <laughs> I love that. I love he just it. looked I like he it. was, yeah. And she just, she nailed him and she nailed Tamsin. I'm like, guys, I know what we've been looking for, but again, we've been, we've got something special. And, and there she is. She's, she was the perfect Tamsin. Tamsin. It's so funny yeah. how casting, I mean, it's you, you, you know what you want kind of, but mm -hmm. when people come in with a certain energy and a, then it has to all come together. I mean, yeah. I, that's something that Lisa Parison and you guys did so brilliantly is you yeah. brought this group of people together that maybe you wouldn't have picked just off the top of your head. But when <laughs> totally. it all comes together, it, it worked so beautifully. No, it's true. And, you know, it's taught me a lot in casting going forward and on other shows and movies. Like, okay, maybe my idea isn't the perfect idea. Maybe there is someone else out there that knows it or gets it more than I do. Yeah. And I just had that experience on another movie and it was, mm -hmm. it's eye opening. It's great. That's so great. It's the fun. Um, I have one final question for you. Sure. Uh, so at, at fan events, I've gotten a lot of fan fiction over the years. We've got very <laughs> creative uh -huh. listeners. Um, if someone listening is interested in getting into story development or hmm. any of that side of the business, how would you advise them to start? Wow, that's a very good question. I mean, the cliched answer is write, just write, write, write. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's a cliche for a reason because it's true. Um, you do need to write and write what you love. Um, because guaranteed out of the box, the first things that you're going to write are not going to be something that you love if you get a professional job writing. Um, but yeah, so it's tough. I mean, if it's someone who hasn't, um, gone to school for screenwriting or studied screenwriting, it's really difficult to, um, to sort of break in as it were. Um, I, you know, I would suggest doing the um, self-publishing, okay. do your own like graphic novels yeah. if you're, if you've And I've seen some of, incredible ones, I have yeah. to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and use social media to get it out there and, um, you know, send it to, you know, when it's good enough and when it's, when you're ready, I would never send anything that you're unsure about. Um always make sure that it's, you know, it's been through the ringer by you and a few people that you trust mm -hmm. to sort of take a look at it, um, with an honest eye. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, then maybe start shopping it around, um, look at, um, many sort of universities and colleges and schools have, um, like if you've got a full-time job, if you're, if this is something you have to pursue on the side, then I would look at, um, definitely, uh, sort of their adult education ones, but they tend to sort of stay pretty, um, for lack of a better word, amateurish, mm -hmm. but I would look for like the actual, um, film schools and writing schools that are, um, really accredited and have a real professional development kind of course to it um and try to do that on the side if you can do whatever you can just keep at it and don't give up because there there's so many people who um their first things they've written or get produced they're like in their 40s and 50s or yeah. you know so yeah. i would say just keep at it and even if nobody else reads it other than you and your circle of friends then you know you've done something more than i have I've never written anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, so, I agree with you, yeah. Stephen. I think, I feel like all artists have to see themselves as, you know, journeymen and journey women yeah. because, yeah. you know, you can get these big hits, of course, but yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong love affair that's usually has to be. not very yeah. well balanced, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but it has to come from your heart. I agree with you. Thank yeah, you so for much sure. for being here today. Sure. I know that um, fans are going to love hearing from you. Oh, I and hope so. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I hope to see you in person very soon. I know. We will. And I'm going to find Finny Fox. Finny Fox. Make he sure is, he's not chewed up by some he dog. He hasn't been there. chewed up by a dog. No, he hasn't. And that's probably why I can't find him, honestly. I probably put him up on a top shelf. So um, thank you so much, Stephen. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast, which is produced by Anna Silk, Rachel Scarston, and Seth Cooperman, with theme music by our very own Blood King, Rick Howland. Please rate, review, and share the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast. This enables us to grow and to continue bringing you exciting new content every week. If you don't already, follow us on Instagram and on our YouTube channel at Lost Girl Rewatch. You can also subscribe to Patreon for exclusive bonus episodes made just for you and get early access to all of our episodes. Where